There was more money lost in crypto. There was $2.2 trillion lost in crypto, which is more money that was lost in 2008, the subprime crisis. So crypto, it's a ticking time bomb that's waiting to blow up and it could take the entire system with it. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for February 28th through March 7th, 2023, while supplies last. This week we feature two coins from the Royal Canadian Mint. The sought-after 2013 Silver Pronghorn Antelope at $3.99 over spot, and the 2022 Silver Maple at $3.40 over spot. The Silver Pronghorn Antelope was made for the Low Mintage Limited Run Wildlife Series, where just one million coins were minted over the course of six months, and then never issued again. With a focus on beautiful design, a face value of $5 Canadian and RCM's strict 4 nines fine purity, these coins further add a degree of rarity to the mix. They come 25 to a tube, 500 to a box, and are available at just $3.99 over spot. We also have 2022 Silver Maples on special. Silver Maples were the first Silver Sovereign coins to be minted at 4 nines fine purity and remain one of the most in-demand coins today. They come 25 to a tube, 500 to a box, and are available at the lowest premium we've seen in more than a year, at just $3.40 over spot. Both coins this week are also IRA eligible, and if you'd like to learn more about a Precious Metals IRA, call us, and we'll be happy to help you in that process. To order these specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend Bob Moriarty, former Marine, Naval Aviator, and financial author. Thank you so much, Bob, for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you again. Well, it's great to have you. And we did get a bunch of viewers questions. Uh, your perspective first on this one, what will be the signal of the crash? Um, will it be subprime loans, zombie company collapse, bond yields, yield spreading, uh, or something else? That's a good question. But the answer is the reason it's so dark outside is because there are so many black swans and it's a question of which of them craps first. Uh, let me give you an example. In 1932, the Credit Anschult Bank in Austria collapsed and it started a series of cascading bank defaults because the assets of one bank are the liabilities of other bank. So one bank crashes, then another, then another, then another, then another. So by 1933, the entire banking system around the world had cratered, and we literally shut down all the banks in the United States except one in Nevada. Now, why is that important? Well, literally today, and I'm going to read this to you, <laughs> Silvergate, a federally insured bank, just blew up from ties to crypto. Okay, so the overall answer is all of the things that that person talked about could cause the crash. But the real reason the crash is, is going to come is because we've been blowing into the financial balloon and it doesn't make any difference when it blows up. We just know it's going to blow up. But uh, it, it, it could easily be Silvergate. Uh, that could start a series of cascading defaults. People don't understand there was more money lost in crypto. There was $2.2 trillion lost in crypto, which is more money that was lost in 2008, the subprime crisis. So crypto, it's a ticking time bomb that's waiting to blow up, and it could take the entire system with it. Another viewer's question on a similar topic. The question is, what will happen to dollar-denominated debt like mortgages when this whole thing blows? That's a good question because 
There's two sides to that. It's a liability to the person who's borrowed the money. It's an asset to the bank. Most paper assets are going to disappear, but really that's what the World Economic Forum is all about. They want the one-tenth of one percent of the wealthy and the powerful and the rich to control all the assets, and they want the rest of us to become slaves. Now, I don't think that's going to succeed. I'm convinced that the World Economic Forum has passed their sell-by date, and that was obvious at Davos oh, a month ago. But uh, it, it, during the Depression, actually, a lot of people lost their homes who had mortgages while they were still paying the mortgages the value of the housing decreased and the banks caused the loan. All I can say is when the banks blow and they're going to blow, it's going to hurt everyone in some way. It definitely does seem like it'll hurt everyone in some way. And as you're saying, I mean, the little man often doesn't win, right? So if there is a currency crisis or something like that and you have a mortgage, it doesn't sound it doesn't seem like it's realistic that you're just going to be able to pay it off with devalued dollars. It seems like they might change the rules where you'd still have a big liability there. Strange enough, I'm going to point people to Amazon or, or to my website where there's a link to Amazon. There's a book that I edited with a German fellow that is considered by the Europeans. It's the classic book on inflation and hyperinflation. And it was written in 1922 and 1923. And in fact, a lot of people who had loans during the German hyperinflation, paid them off in, in cheap dollars. That's entirely possible, but you did make a, a good point. Basically, small guys are always going to get screwed. I mean, it certainly happened in 2008 where they just totally ignored the law, they totally ignored the rules, and they bailed out the banks at the expense of, of small people. Um, small people always get screwed. Now, one of the things that individual states are doing right now um, is actually legalizing precious metals as legal tender. Um, And I think this is very interesting. We have a viewer asking uh, about this, wondering about your opinion on this. And also, there are some companies out there that are offering like alternative banking in uh, precious metals. And you can use and and for example, in Utah, where you can use like a uh, I believe like a debit card or credit card against uh, the precious metals you have stored because they're now technically legal tender. So your perspective on that, and is that maybe a way that states are helping um, the little guy here? There's there's two parts to that. I think states making gold and silver legal tender is relatively meaningless. But if there's a situation where a bank or, or a lending institution allows you to link to your precious metals. Gold Money did that a few years ago, and I had an account with them. And and they, for some reason, they stopped doing that. I thought it was a great idea. I, I will tell you that when the crash comes, and we certainly are into it already, uh, at, at the absolute depth, it doesn't make any difference what the rules are. If you've got gold and silver in your hand, you're going to have something of value. In 1922, in Berlin, you could buy a nice apartment for a British sovereign or a U.S. $5 gold piece. Uh, You could go out and have a tremendous weekend with a U.S. $1 bill. So uh, the, the value of assets is going to change enormously. And yes, there are going to be times you're going to be able to pay off your mortgage with cheap dollars. If you go into hyperinflation, okay, and and you have something, okay, of value, pay off the debt, okay, with a hyperinflation. Uh, obviously, gold and silver are going to be the most liquid, but 
you're still going to have cash, you're still going to have bonds. Now, moving on here to this next viewer's question, the viewer comments, why can't the American people refuse the debt which uh, politicians take on? So essentially, the, the question is, you know, why can't we stand up and refuse this? Because ultimately, uh, we're not voting for the, um, you know, the national debt to continue to increase and the deficit to uh, get larger and larger each year. But we're taking on the burden of this. So it doesn't seem fair. Uh, I know life isn't fair, right, sometimes. But what are some ways that people can actually take a stand and not be affected uh, by the huge debt that the U.S. is taking on? Do you remember Jimmy Carter's famous quotation about life? Sometimes life is not fair. What happens if you don't pay your mortgage? Loots the house. What happens if you don't pay the tax? You go into jail. Exactly. Uh, we're in a place the United States has never been before. It, it's nice to say we need to stand up and take a stand but quite bluntly we need to let the house burn down and we need to reconstruct after it burns down uh we should take a stand we should be vocal we should con uh, contact congress and say we're upset but uh the fact of the matter is right now they don't care when the system burns down, perhaps they'll care them. And then what does that look like? You're saying in this new system, we need to let it burn down first. What are actions that people can be taking now um, to maybe build community? Or what is the what are some of the steps that people should take in preparation of that, of rebuilding? Well, that's, that's a good question. And you raised something we have talked about before. Uh, community is very important. When we started thinking in the 1930s, though, the government was really responsible for taking care of us. And there were all these things like Social Security and then Medicare and Medicaid in the 60s and unemployment insurance. They're all bullshit. OK, they're going to fail because the government is absolutely catastrophically bankrupt. We need to have a sense of community. We need to work with our neighbors. We need to have gardens. We need to have insurance against chaos financially, which is gold and silver. We need to stay out of debt, and we need to help each other because it's going to be bad, okay? The strange thing is the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, but they had gone through hard times, uh, literally since about 1921, okay? And they were used to hard times, but uh, they went through some very difficult times in the transition. The United States has, has had a free ride on the dollar since 1944, and that free ride is over, okay? The United States is now committing the biggest terrorist attack in history against their own allies in Europe, okay? And that, that, how much crazier can you get than that? When you look at the people running the government in the United States, the only term that I can use is they're freaks. And that is across the board. That's not saying the Democrats are freaks. That's not saying the Republicans are freaks. They're all freaks. These people are not leaders. So it, it's burning down now. There will be a banking system collapse. The financial edifice is going to collapse. And all you want to do is survive. And then we get started all over again. Anybody who, who's interested should be reading Fourth Turning. And it talks about two alternatives. One alternative is a totalitarian government, which people are certainly working towards now. And the other is a, a turn to freedom. Now, I am seeing tiny shoots, okay, of people saying, we want to be free. We want to have responsibility for our own lives. And uh, there's going to be a lot more of that in the future. That's a good thing. 
definitely is a good thing taking responsibility for our own lives it's it's what everyone should definitely do and it seems like we've kind of uh, lost that nowadays but it, it's good to see that there are movements uh, towards that again uh, we have a question from kevin here he's wanting to know about uh, precious metal mining stocks relating to this collapse in the system that you're uh, foretelling here. So he asks, Bob, will there be any way to withdraw junior mining stock profits out of the system? You say it appears, uh, you say uh, we are close to a collapse. How do you suggest saving our profits before the cookie jar devours our hand? Well, uh, the interesting thing is when you own shares in any stock, uh, that's fractional ownership of whatever the company is, whether it's Tesla, whether it's GM, uh, or whether it's uh, a mining company, okay? It's fractional ownership. From 1929 until 1940, the highest gaining stock of the New York Stock Exchange was Homestake Mining. And you could buy the stock at $9 in I think 1931, and it was paying a four dollar dividend a few years later. I believe, and it's just my opinion. And I want people to understand this. When you see the video of Moses coming down the mountain and he's carrying his tablets, if you look very closely, you are not going to see me next to him. I didn't come down the mountain with Moses, okay? But uh, what I will say, uh, I invest in two things. I invest in gold and silver as an insurance policy against chaos. I do not care if the price goes up or down because it's an insurance policy, and I don't care about the price any more than I care about the price of my automobile. However, the excess cash that I have, I put into resource stocks because I believe we're in the most important transition in 500 years from a debt-based system into a resource-based system. And I think the returns on resources in the next few years is going to be extraordinary. Now, that might answer this uh, next viewer's question we have from Stefan. Uh, he wants to know, do you hold gold and silver stocks? So I guess he's uh, referring to mining, exploration, development stocks there. And if so, do you hold them for the expected major bull run or do you trade them? So can you kind of break that down for our viewers? What makes you want to hold the stock versus uh, just trading it for the short term? When you have assets, everything that you have that's an asset is an investment. It could be cash, it could be gold, could be silver, it could be Tesla, it could be land. Uh, I hold physical gold and silver as an insurance policy. It's chaos. We've talked about that. And the excess uh, capital that I have, I, I put into resource stocks, uh, gold stocks, silver stocks, platinum stocks, uh, some oil stocks. Uh, from a relative point of view, uh, let me give you an example. In 1929, uh, on the Dow Jones, uh, mining stocks were about 10% of the total market capitalization. It's under half a percent now. Uh, I, I think it was 3% or 4% in 1980. So the potential return is enormous. And, and the fact of the matter is that a market crash is an ongoing thing. The world doesn't stop. Most people still have jobs. They're just a lot more poor than they were before. So uh, I, I don't think there'll be any issue whatsoever with holding resource stocks. And they can shut the stock market down for a year, and that doesn't change the value of the stocks. They're still going to be producing. They're still going to be exploring. And, and they're still going to be a very real asset. So I have, I have no problem whatsoever owning stocks, and I have no problem whatsoever planning on keeping those stocks. Now, I have heard that in the entire kind of supply chain that we're looking at right now, and I guess 
mining stocks would be kind of a tiny part of that, right? There are a lot of different components and a lot of different stages from uh, production to development and actually getting the metal out of the ground and refining it. Um, it seems like there are a lot of steps there, but if you're looking for you know, a banking system collapse, then if people can't pay each other, how would they be able to still, you know, actually mine metal out the ground, out of the ground and refine it? It seems like that may be a major issue there. Uh, it will be an issue, but people always sort it out. What we're going to go through is something people have been through thousands of times before, and, and they just figure it out. There are certain things that we require. We require food. We require warmth. We require shelter. And we're going to figure out how to do it. Uh, If gold and silver have any value, they're going to figure out how to mine it. They're going to figure out how to pay for fuel. They're going to figure out how to pay each other. Um, There's going to be chaos, but it's only chaos if you're not prepared for it. If you're prepared for it, it's going to be the most wonderful opportunity in the world. I will tell you, of all of those families that are filthy rich now, they made their fortunes during the Great Depression. And the same thing is true. Uh, One of the analogies that I use is that there's two kinds of assets. There's paper assets and they're real assets. If you've got a car or if you've got a house or if you've got a boat, That's an asset, okay? And it has some value. Now, if you've got a bond, for example, on Silvergate, that that might be an asset, might not be an asset. That might be a piece of paper that just kind of floats away. If you've got shares in Tesla or if you've got uh, cryptocurrencies, those things may just float away. Uh, But in a depression, The value of assets doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the ownership. There's a tremendous opportunity if people will understand, if they will do some research into it, to be some tremendous opportunities in the near future. Now, we have a last viewer's question here about energy and oil. Um, Your perspective first on uh, oil right now as an investment, they're asking specifically about Exxon. Uh, actually, I, I'm not qualified to talk about Exxon. However, I, I will say I saw a chart, and I wish I could print it out, show it to you, showing the correlation between energy consumption and wealth of countries. And the wealth of countries is 100% correlated to energy consumption. The whole climate change narrative is fraud. The whole anti-fossil fuels narrative is fraud. The electric vehicles narrative is fraud. The green energy narrative is fraud. We need fossil fuels, period. It is that simple. I I see fossil fuels as being a tremendous opportunity in the next few years. And I happen to own shares in a company that I've owned for, I think, 14 years now that has the ability to increase how much oil comes out of an oil well by 10 to 15 percent. And the fact is the energy companies are not interested because there's so much oil around. So it's an interesting situation where we act like we're running out of oil and oil is something to be avoided. It's absolute rubbish. Uh, The United States has just put rules in effect that would require half of the gas powered stoves in the United States to be taken off the market. Natural gas is one of the cleanest forms of energy. The idea that natural gas is somehow polluting is so absurd. Uh, there, there are so many things that we're being told now that are just utter fiction. And um, nuclear power does have its own unique issues. But natural gas is a wonderful, cheap, abundant, uh, clean energy. And we're trying to use electric vehicles, and electric vehicles get their power from coal-fired 
plants, the coal-fired plants, are the most anti-environment. So you know, we're just doing so many silly things. And, and it all goes together. It all goes to, to when, when you don't have honest money, you don't have an honest economy. And if you want an honest economy, all you have to do is go back to honest money. My belief is that we will do that because it makes sense. And then as for energy, your main point is that, you know, this green energy uh, initiative, these green energy initiatives around the world are going to fail and we still need um, fossil fuels. We still need oil. We still need natural gas. Um, So you're bullish on all those. Absolutely. I I bullish on all of those except for the green energy, the green energy fraud. And it is fraud. Is based around green energy. It's such a wonderful idea that we need to kill fossil fuels as soon as possible. But to have green energy, you need copper, you need nickel, you need cobalt, you need lithium. And to have those, it requires a lot of fossil fuel to produce them. Now, if you actually work the numbers out, the demand would be so high and the price would go so high that from an economic point of view, it just doesn't make sense. I've got a full-size medium car using diesel fuel, and I get about 50 miles to the gallon, and that's in town. When, When I was a kid, if you had something like Ford Falcon and got 18 miles a gallon, you were doing extremely well. Uh, gasoline powered and diesel powered vehicles are are incredibly efficient and far more efficient from a economics point of view than electric vehicles. I I frankly think the whole electric vehicle thing is fraud. All right. Well, Bob Moriarty, we really appreciate your time today. Any last thoughts before we let you go? And where can our viewers find you online and also your books on Amazon there? I I appreciate saying that uh, people go every time we have a conversation and they buy some books. And I've made the books so cheap that you can buy the books in electronic form for 99 cents a piece. And if you can't afford 99 cents, you're probably not an investor. But um, We have some interesting times ahead, and I would highly encourage everyone to do as much research as possible and understand there are no gurus and there are no experts. You're going to have to think for yourself. You're going to have to take responsibility for yourself, for your family and your finances. And it's a wonderful opportunity if you're prepared, and it's going to be a disaster if you're not prepared. And quite bluntly, that's not up to me, and it's not up to Elijah. It's up to you. Fantastic, Bob. Once again, thank you so much for your time, and God bless. Okay. It's always fun. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.